image this. Uh, this is uh, actually comes from a new paper that um, that my good friend Tim Whiteman uh, from McGill has been kind enough to uh, include me on, but I have to give credit to Tim. This is kind of his baby, and he's been driving the bus on this one. Um, proposing what we're doing here is we're proposing a new measurement model of pain, and it's worthwhile sort of understanding this a little bit. Um, what we've got here in this sort of spiky-looking ball is a pain experience that's kind of the core of this ball that we really can't see. It's the kind of that black box area. We cannot, as of right now, accurately capture that pain experience. Okay? We can never be sure if what you're telling me is actually what you're feeling. Or if what I'm hearing, you're telling me is what you're feeling. However, we do have some things that we can capture to sort of understand a little bit about what might be happening inside. The pain narrative we're kind of pitching here is as close to a gold standard as we can get, which is really just what you're telling me. So it's not your 0 to 10 scale or whatever, but it's, it's, it really requires me to just sit and listen, sometimes shut my app and just let you talk. And if I'm a good, active listener, if I'm asking the right questions, I'm getting close, closer and closer to your actual experience. So the pain narrative is as close to a gold standard as we have. Moving further and further away from the true experience, then, are the pain measures. And we kind of got out here on the spikes. And the, first, the first level of spikes would be the self-report measures. So if we're using good, sort of valid, I'm intentionally using air quotes here when I say the word valid, um, because again, without a gold standard, we can never truly validate a pain scale. Um, but if we are using good self-report measures, then that's giving us some standardized means of trying to understand this whole experience. And we can sometimes use this and sort of start to triangulate if we use different measures to try and sort of pinpoint maybe where that experience is. And then finally, right on the very tips of those little spiky balls are the non-self-report measures, the physiological measures. This might be where functional MRI exists, for example, okay, or, or some of the diagnostic imaging, right? It's an aspect. It's giving us perhaps a clue as to what might be happening. But as you can see on this ball, every, every subsequent step we're moving further and further from the true experience. And so I like this. What I like about this is this idea that the pain narrative is as close to gold standard as we're going to get. But one of the things we need to recognize, of course, is that pain doesn't have a language of its own. Um, we use analogy and metaphor to say my pain is shooting or stabbing or burning or shocking. But I can tell you that people who have actually been stabbed rarely describe their pain as stabbing who have actually been shot would really describe their pain as shooting. Okay? Um, so we use these things as sort of a metaphor. I'm hoping that, that you understand when I say my pain is shooting. Like I'm hoping that metaphor sort of holds some meaning for you. Okay? But it's the best we have, right? Because it really isn't a dedicated pain language. So even to say that the pain narrative is as close to gold standard as we can get, I believe that's true, but it's not the true experience. It's affected by maybe your ability to use language, my ability to understand your language. Okay? So why? So I've just said we can't really tap this true experience, and yet here we are in a workshop for pain assessment. I spend many of my hours of my days thinking about this and working on this. So clearly, I must think it's somewhat important. Why do we assess or try to measure or quantify this experience? So that we can see how it changes over time. So we can see how it changes over time. If it changes over time. Okay. okay I'm going to write some of these down here. All right, to track uh, change over time, and we'll call that evaluation. Good. One. Why else do we try to do this? To justify our profession. Okay, I'll just they don't that. have they don't have pain. You can't quantify it, and you can't uh, leading under her treat it by evaluating. It over okay. Time. All right. I agree with what you're saying. So um, tracking outcomes is going to be important. Right, um, because we want to justify why we treat these folks. That hey, look, they actually started at an eight, and now they're a two, or they weren't at work, and now they are at work, something like that. So as an outcome, I think very important, and uh, we talk about there even as perhaps uh, discharge planning, even in that case. All right, that maybe we're we're shooting for some kind of target there. Why else do we try to quantify this experience? To understand the patient. To understand the patient. What do you mean by that? Well. Having a number, having the narrative will help us 
understand their experience better. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we're we're doing our best to try to capture the true experience. You know, recognizing we could probably never can, but we can get close. Good. Any other reasons? To guide us, uh, healthcare providers in terms of like coming out with a treatment program for them. So if they're in a lot of pain, obviously you don't want them to do like really strenuous exercises. Okay. Yeah, uh, kind of hit on two things there. So for one was, we hope that it's going to guide some of our, our clinical decisions. Mm -hmm. And then the other one you mentioned was, um, you may identify certain um, aspects of this pain experience that might lead you away from, yeah, this is kind of the same, sorry, I don't want to be too leading on this one. That's kind of the same as treatment decisions, but there's another aspect of that. I'm not sure if you picked up on that, but I'm going to say, I'll give it to you, sort of diagnosis or screening perhaps, that you may be able to use these good tools to actually identify certain things in certain people that you can actually treat specifically uh, through, through different uh, strategies. So uh, there may be some of these tools that we can use as diagnosis or screening tools, and that then may lead us towards one treatment or another. Well, maybe also for measuring, getting them to measure, allow uh, them to self-reflect. Sure. So allowing them to, to self-reflect, um, absolutely. And I think that can be important in a couple of ways. Uh, for one, I just said that pain lacks a, lacks a language, but sometimes we can give a scale that perhaps has a couple of different sort of um, items or, or comments or statements on there that the patient can look at and go, oh yeah, that's what I've been trying to say. So it might help a little bit with communication that way. Plus. You know, I think what you're saying is it allows the patient to maybe watch and see, oh, I have improved, you know, look, I started off here and now I'm here, something like that. So it gives them an opportunity for that as well. Good. Um, anything else? What else are we doing this? One here that I, I quite like, which is the idea of, of prognosis of theranosis. And um, I will credit uh, my good friend Jim Elliott for the term theranosis. Jim is currently watching us online, um, I hadn't heard this term before, he pitched it to me. But prognosis, both of these things are really attempting to predict the future. And when we talk about the prognosis module here, we're going to understand how pain assessment can help us guess where somebody's going to be three or six months from now. Theranosis kind of ties in with treatment decisions. It's trying to predict the response to a treatment. So those are both sort of future-oriented things. So I would say there's a lot that actually assessing pain well can give us. All right. So there is a reason for doing that, even though we, may, we have to recognize that we're never going to get true experience. 